Welcome to the ribbon cutting event for the new Agricultural Sciences Building at Utah State University. I'm Noelle Cockett, Vice President for Extension and the Dean of the College of Agriculture, and I'm serving as your MC for today's event. We originally gave some thought to having this celebration outside, cutting a ribbon that spanned the front door and officially opening the building. But in short order, we came to the realization that weather in February in Cache Valley was probably not conducive to an outdoor event. So we moved the ribbon cutting inside, even though the venue means we're a bit cozy. And I have to say we're probably even cozier than what I once thought we would be. So I really appreciate all the enthusiasm for today's event. We also realized that the majority of you would be standing during the ceremony. Therefore, the three speakers in today's program, myself, followed by Commissioner Leonard Blackham from the Utah Department of Food and Egg, and who will then be followed by USU President Stan Albrecht, we all agreed that we would keep our comments short. At the conclusion of the talks, we'll cut the ribbon here in the atrium, and then we'd like to invite all of you to explore and enjoy the building, followed by world-famous eggy ice cream in the cafe off to my right. As many people have expressed to me over the last week, this is truly a momentous and long-anticipated event for the occupants of the building, as well as USU campus community. However, the impact and reach of this beautiful building in a key location on the Quad extends far beyond the 330 students, staff, and faculty who will move in in the next few months. To me, this building represents the essence of Utah State University, which is the land-grant institution for the state of Utah. The breadth and depth in research, teaching, and extension that will occur here and extend out from this bu building is truly astonishing. These three functions that are pillars for USU are dispersed across all 127,000 square feet of the building. The north side of the building contains primarily student classrooms and meeting areas with research laboratories on the second and the third floors. The south side of the building contains primarily offices, meeting rooms, and staffing functions. The atrium in which we are located provides connections to the floors through the stairway and the elevators. Faculty, staff, and students in three departments in the College of Agriculture, including Animal, Dairy, and Veterinary Sciences, Plant, Soils, and Climate, and Applied Economics, and the Journalism and Communications Department in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences are housed within the building. There are also spaces for the administrative offices of the College of Agriculture, the Utah Agriculture Experiment Station, and USU Extension, as well as several centers, including Western SARE, Western Rural Development Center, USU Botanical Center, and the State 4-H program. I will be the first to admit that it has been a long road to this day. As I was cleaning out my office in anticipation of the move to the building, I found some old files that reminded me of the many steps that were required and the twists and turns that the road has taken. In 2004, the university began contemplating the renovation of the E.G. Peterson Agriculture Sciences Building, but with significant concern on how a 1950s era structure could be retrofitted to meet today's construction standards. In 2005, Daryl Hart, at that time director of USU facilities, wondered if the College of Agriculture would be willing to change direction from renovation of the existing building to construction of a new building on the quad where the formal, former Merrill Library had been sited. After one nanosecond of consideration, <laughs> I enthusiastically endorsed that change. 
In 2006 and 7, the university laid the groundwork for a capital facilities funding request by giving multiple presentations to the state legislature, the state building board, and other organizations that were willing to support our request. As time went on, more and more people understood the need, caught the vision, and endorsed the concept, which led to approval of programming and design funding in the 2008 legislative session. We then selected three companies which have remained deeply engaged with us throughout the entire project, including the CSRA architectural firm based in Salt Lake City, the HDR architectural firm with personnel from their Princeton, Phoenix, and Sacramento offices, and last but certainly not least, Jacobson Construction. I'd like to thank all of those who have given their time, creativity, and efforts to make this building as wonderful as it is. Over the next 18 months, through a series of meeting, programming needs were determined, which allowed us to estimate square footage and project costs. We then carried a request for construction funding to the state legislature. President Albrecht conveyed a strong commitment to our project by making it the number one request for USU during the 2010 legislative session. As he will describe, after several weeks of ups and downs, construction funding was approved in the final moments of the session. We are particularly mindful of the strong support given to the project from several Utah legislators, numerous agricultural commodity groups, and alumni of USU. Thank you to all who caught the vision and helped us make this possible. Within weeks of the funding approval, an official groundbreaking occurred, and now, almost two years later, we stand in the lobby of the final product. Through multiple meetings, people from HDR, CSRA, and Jacobson Construction, as well as personnel from USU facilities and the state DFCM office, and future occupants of the building hammered out the building's details. Early on in the process, Brian Kowalczyk from HDR walked us through a visiting session which led to a few but strongly held concepts. We wanted a building that emphasized collaboration and connections as well as a strong recognition of the natural world. The elements of collaboration and connection have come through again and again in the design with the building contained numerous study and conference rooms of various sizes and location, lounge areas full of comfortable chairs and great lighting, the cafe on the northwest corner, and a large plaza for all to enjoy. The building is full of natural products, limestones on the floor and stairs, bamboo wood in the office cabinetry, as well as on the walls and the stairways, natural fabrics and leather on the furniture, and a color scheme based on fall season palette. Floor to ceiling windows in most offices, the lobby and cafe ensures a connection to the outside and a centrally located atrium topped with a large skylight allows sunlight to shine in on all four floors. There's also a strong connection to the land through the building's landscaping which was designed by the MGBA firm with input from faculty in the plant soils and climate and landscape architect and environmental planning departments. The beautifully landscaped space includes native plants and turf laid out in a pattern reminiscent of agronomic crop fields. I'm particularly pleased with the sidewalks and benches that crisscross the plaza north of the building. That layout presents a very welcoming draw, inviting people to come in and meet with the occupants of the building, as well as to stop, pause, and enjoy the USU campus, including a variety of activities that occur on the quad with a cup of eggy ice cream in hand. A special distinction is the building's anticipated designation as LEED Gold, which is an international recognition of green building design, construction, operations, and maintenance. Several important features will lead to this designation, 
including solar panels on the south facing sunshades, use of, use of environmentally friendly construction materials, motion sensors in all buildings, all rooms that control the lights, and water efficient landscaping. I also want to highlight the quality of the workmanship from the design to the final details that has gone into the building through the efforts of literally hundreds of people. I would be remiss not to mention some of these individuals, including the Bryans and Steve Smith from HDR, the Wheatons from CSRA, John, Matt, Ash, Martell, and Jason from Jacobson Construction, Dave McKay from DFCM, John Fitch from USU Facilities, and Tom Peterson from Thomas Christian Consulting. While I mention these people by name, please know that many, many others contributed to this world-class structure. The final product now serves as a signature building for the university that is worthy of its location on the quad. Thank you to all who have made it possible. The building has been further personalized through several, several lovingly bestowed namings, which I'd like to highlight now. On the first floor, there is the Campbell Scientific Lecture Hall, the Dusty Furman Teaching Lab, Tom C. Peterson Study Room, Sidney M. Peterson Study Room, Anthon H. Lund Study Room, Utah Farm Bureau Computer Lab, Luke Family Cafe on the Quad. The second floor includes the Keith Godfrey Conference Room, named in honor of John Keith and Bruce Godfrey, two faculty members who served in the Applied Economics Department. The third floor includes the Apogee Conference Room in recognition of a spin-off instrument company developed by a PSC faculty member. On the fourth floor, there is the Utah Wool Growers Conference Room on the West End, the Jacobson Construction Conference Room in the middle, and the H. Allen Luke Conference Room on the East End. The individuals who have made these namings possible are truly wonderful friends and supporters of what we do and accomplished. I am honored that they have chosen to be part of the building through their gifts. I would also like to draw your attention to the Egg Memorial that is located in the plaza to the north of this building and behind me. This beautiful art piece was designed to represent the students and instructor who lost their lives in the van accident in 2005. I would, will also mention an inscription that was crafted by Cody Bingham, who was the ASUSU College of Agriculture Senator in 2005-2006 and his family, and which has been transcribed on a bench adjacent to the memorial. To honor the men lost, their families, and the agricultural community touched by the tragedy of September 2005, this bench provides a place of reflection and comfort. May the spirit of agriculture always be found at Utah State University. I am confident that USU will continue to honor the spirit of agriculture and all it represents in the coming decades. It's certainly noteworthy that this ribbon cutting event is held in the same year as the 150th anniversary of the Morrell Act, which created the land grant system for the United States. The building is also a fitting recognition of the significant and extensive legacy in agricultural sciences at USU, beginning in 1888 with its designation as the Utah Agricultural College. In conclusion, I want to say that the new Agricultural Sciences Building is more than I ever dreamed it would be when we started the process over eight years ago. This building will provide a welcome to the community because of its placement at the south entrance to the campus and its location on the quad. Its aura, created through beautiful design and exceptional elements, will provide inspiration to all who pass through. Its structure will become a place of activity where students can learn and study and engage with some of the best faculty and staff on campus. Its space will create new memories for USU students and visitors through the classroom and study room experiences, purchase of Aggie ice cream in the Luke Family Cafe, 
and time spent in the Memorial Plaza. Its people will engage people, others, in research, education, and outreach that will extend to the four corners of the world. And most importantly, its spirit will be a lasting part of USU. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here today with you. This is a very special occasion. I'm just honored to be here, represent the state of Utah, the governor, the agencies that are involved in the farm community. I guess somewhat in general, we kind of think that's a bit of our charge. I think you guys feel that way here at the university and it's wonderful that we have that. I appreciate President Albrecht. I appreciate Dean Cockett and I get to work with Vice President uh, Chuck Gay as well. Great leaders great leaders for this university and what they have done for the state of Utah and for agriculture in the state of Utah it just can't be overemphasized. It is so wonderful to see that. And here we are in a marvelous structure re-emphasizing agriculture at a land-grant university right here in the quad. I don't know of anything that speaks more volumes than that, President, and to you and Noel, I just tip my hat, I should have my cowboy hat, and thank you for what you're doing for agriculture. It is so important. You know, agriculture sometimes gets forgotten. And if you're like me, I love to go into Costco. I like seeing all that food and I walk out the door and I say, how can there be any problem? Look at all that food. Look at all those choices. 40,000 choices in an average grocery store today when you walk in there. I mean, America is about choice. Choice of where we live, choice of what we do, choices that we get to make. And having that abundant food supply is so critical to the American way of life. Abundant energy, abundant use of natural resources, all those things is what has brought us to this point today. And you know, we forget about it a lot of times. We've asked city planners, what do you plan for? Do you plan for future water needs? Oh, absolutely. Do you plan for housing needs? Absolutely. Do you plan for your food supply? What are you talking about? <clears throat> Why would we plan for food? Go to the grocery store. You know, we walk out again. Well, how could there be any problem? But that abundance that is there, if we're not careful, could change. And this institution and putting agriculture back on top will be a major factor in making sure that doesn't happen, in my opinion. We feed 7 billion people today. Within 40 years, it'll probably be 10 billion people. It's going to be a huge demand on agriculture over the next few years to feed that number of people. There's a theory that's out there and it keeps raising its head every once in a while. It was formulated in 1798 by a guy called Thomas Malthus. 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 It's the Malthus theory. And the theory is basically the power of population <clears throat> is so superior to the power of the earth to produce. And he predicted in 1908, in 25 years, we're going to have mass starvation upon the earth because agriculture cannot feed the population growth. That was basically a little over 200 years ago. The theory still exists today and it comes up every once in a while. There's no way we can do it. Well, if we produced agriculture like they did back in the 1800s, that's true. If we produced agriculture like we did back in the 1900s, it'd be true. If we produced food like we did in 1950, it'd even be true, but we don't. And the reason we don't is because of the blessings that institutions such as Utah State and their scientists have brought to us and provided us with the means of production. Do you know how much a cow used to produce in the 1900s? 4,500 pounds per year. In, in, in 1985, it increased to 13,000 pounds, and today, most dairy cows produce 20,000 pounds of milk a year. Production yields on bushels per acre, you know, say, show the same type of thing. We got farmers today who uh, our good farmers can produce 200 bushels of corn on a piece of crop land. It used to be 50. I mean, that's the way we do it, and then we do it because of a lot of this work that's been done at this institution and similar institutions through the world. It's work that needs to continue. We could give you example after example of, of, of the greatness that comes out of these universities. Well, can we do it in the future? I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes if we're smart. 
If we aren't smart, we won't. We have a few challenges in that regard. This university is going to help in that in a big way. You know, I often say knowledge plus understanding means wisdom. And what we need to do is we need to have wisdom today. There's a lot of people that have knowledge, but they don't have much understanding. Here a few months ago, I'm a turkey grower, you know. One of these animal rights groups was talking about the mistreatment of turkeys. And then at the end of their article, they said, you know, these really make wonderful pets. <laughs> and I looked at them, and I'll ask you, any of you that ever raised a turkey, would you ever raise another one? Which, if we're not careful, will cripple the production capacity of the farmers of this nation. And the farmers of this nation are the farmers who produce the food. We have the richest soils in the world. We have great climatic conditions, the Midwest especially. Our coastlines are rich. We produce most of the food of the world. That we have starvation going on, right? We have hungry people, but it's not because of our lack of ability to produce. It's the lack and politic problems that exist out in the world today that really create that. We see a lot of unrest. We see governments being toppled today, primarily being toppled because the bread lines can't deliver. When people in Egypt stand in bread lines, and the bread line, they run out halfway through the bread line, and people have nothing to eat. Civil distress occurs, and, and we're seeing that. And, we, and these challenges will be with us, and we can do the best we can. We need this university to do it. We need to help them help us in educating folks. And I'm excited here that we're bringing different disciplines together at the university here to consider ways of bringing the total picture together and putting the balance together so people can have an understanding of what's needed and make the right decisions. I'm excited about having the sciences and the expansion and, and uh, the good work that's being done. And just recently, we had the economic, applied economic department here do some research for us and analysis of the importance of agriculture in the state of Utah. We found out that agriculture and ag processing, which is dependent upon production, is 14% of the state economy. That's nothing to be ignored. Not only that, but it creates the basic of what we need, food. And, we, and nationally, that number is about 19%. It's important. It's major. 14 to 19% of the jobs on a national basis, 19% of the jobs are tied to agriculture. Who do we need in those jobs? We need the most talented. We need the smartest students. And they're setting the stage to attract those students here. If I was a new student today, I looked at the labs upstairs. We walked through them last night. I thought, boy, this would be fun. They look good, you know. I look at the faculty that's here. I think, you know, these guys are talented. This would be fun to be a student again. Well, just about. <laughs> Biotechnology can bring us amazing things, new technology and mechanical, electronic. I mean, when you take a tractor today that you can go out there and you get the tractor started to get in the field, put it on the GPS and say, plant the field for me, all I got to do is stay awake enough in case something goes wrong. You know, what a world we live in today. And that's why it only costs us 10% or less to feed ourselves. And that's why we enjoy so many blessings that we do. I mean, it's amazing. I remember when I was a boy, my grandfather farmed with horses, and most of the people did with horses, you know. He had four plugs, I believe, four horsepower farm, 30, 40 acres. My golly, we haven't got toys that got that few, you know, the toys the kids ride in the driveway or have that many horsepower. And it's amazing what's happened in our lifetime and those kind of things I think can continue if we're wise and make sure that we are willing to accept the blessings that technology can bring to us and a lot of that's going to be generated right, generated right here at this university. Well, I can tell you, Utah citizens support you. We've done a little polling. Utah citizens seem to get it. They support local production. They want food security. They don't want their food coming from other nations. They want it coming from Utah and as much as possible from Utah. We can't prov provide our, all our own food, but we can do a good percentage of it, and Utahns want us to. They want farmers to be successful. They, ranch they recognize farmers and ranchers as being good environmental stewards. They support public grazing, that type of thing. What we've got to make sure we do is we've got to make sure we reinforce that with the citizens over the next few years so that they can maintain those opinions and those attitudes. We need to make sure that all these anti-things that are coming out and that brings the questions into their mind. Should I continue with my philosophy that we're balancing that through the education at the university, through extension, through the Department of Ag and all the partners 
to give them the information so they can say, yes, I can maintain my confidence in American farmers. I know they're good stewards. I can believe in the technology. I'm not going to be poisoned by this. And we can supply the needs of the future and have the balance with nature that's needed. I am firmly convinced that nature and man can be in balance. We can meet the needs. The earth is full and plenty to spare. The theory of the Mathis theory is no more relevant today than it was 200 years ago. Thank you for allowing me to join you. I'm just so pleased, and it's no pleasure at the university. It's good to be an Aggie, isn't it? <laughs>
make sure that Utah State University, our faculty and our students are at the forefront of the work that is being done in these critical areas. Now this ribbon cutting today has other important timing implications for us. On Friday evening we will celebrate Condor State, Utah State University and as part of that we will celebrate the 150th anniversary of President Lincoln's signing of the Morrill Act, that key piece of legislation that created this great armada of land grant institutions across our great country. We are a proud member of that set of institutions. Uh, American higher education has become the envy of the world because of that set of institutions. We are proud of what we're accomplishing as one of those great institutions. We've had a 73% in ag majors in the last four years as one reflection of that. Uh, and we continue the land grant tradition of carrying our message around the entire state. If you look at some of the recent happenings around the state, 51 new degree programs, a 52% increase in student enrollments, a 59% increase in degrees completed at our regional campuses. This is one of our great success stories. And let me just quickly note a third important event that is part of our agricultural story this year. We have now selected, with Ken White's help and that of his colleagues, the first set of in-state students who will comprise the first class of our new veterinary science program. This is Utah State University's first ever professional school, and I think it represents a wonderful additional step in the upward trajectory that is Utah State University. And so what an amazing trilogy. This building, the 150th anniversary of the land-grant institutions and the launching of our vet school. And I would just add to what Vice President Cockett said, the uh, lovely plaza just to the north of us will now be the home, and I think the right home, for that beautiful memorial sculpture that honors those of our university family who lost their lives in the tragic van, van accident a few years ago. As I walk past that beautiful memorial, I'm reminded that this will now become a place for quiet reflection for generations of students, faculty, and friends of our university. And I would like to especially thank members of the families of those who lost their lives and friends of those families who have contributed in such important ways to what we're celebrating here today and to what is out on the plaza. Many individuals have done so much. Uh, the Commissioner uh, Noel and her team doing such excellent work, uh, Senator Hilliard, other members of our Cash Valley delegation, Representative Hunsaker was absolutely critical to us, uh, Randy Parker and his friends at the Farm Bureau, uh, other folks representing the various state agricultural interests around the state, legislators from and around the state, all were an important part of what we're experiencing here today. Jacobson Construction has been the perfect partner for this project. We acknowledge the professionalism and commitment and the excellence that is their team. We acknowledge John Fitch and the USU Facilities team who have done such an outstanding job. Vice President Cockett, uh, Noel, we've been partners from day one on this project. Uh, appreciate your leadership, the, the tireless commitment that you have to bring this project to completion. And I appreciate the work of uh, Tom Peterson, whose vision and dedication have been essential to making even better the quality of the final product. Let me conclude with just a brief quote from one of my favorite authors, Pat Conroy. In addition to writing wonderful novels, he has a little book that's entitled My Reading Life, and in there he details some of the books that he's read over his life that have made the greatest difference. And in there he describes uh, an encounter with an old friend who gave him a copy of a book entitled Growth of the Soil by Norwegian writer Knut Hamsen. As this book was given to him, his friend said, this is an essential book, a necessary book. It's the most important book I've ever read. Conroy answered, I'll read it. And his friend said, no, you don't just read this book. You must enter it, live it. It contains the great truth, which is, asked Conroy, Everything of virtue springs from the soil. Civilization oft times comes along to ruin it, but you can always find the truth if it comes from the earth. We affirm today our commitment to that truth as we celebrate this wonderful new building. Thank you. Thank you, President and Commissioner. 
We're now moving into the official cutting of the ribbon. Um, that's always a fun event. And then I'd like to invite you to explore the building. In addition to the offices in the south wing, please plan to walk through the laboratories on the second and third floors. There are 19 College of Agriculture student ambassadors stationed throughout, ready with information about the building's various functions. As I'm looking around the crowd though, I also think that a lot of the building occupants are here today. So you might actually find people sitting in those offices, but we gave them strict instructions. They can't move any boxes in until tomorrow. So I also feel like I need to make a couple comments about my space. I try to be a very humble person, but as it turned out, I ended up with this just amazing office on the fourth floor. And so I decided as time goes on, and everybody tells me what an amazing view that I have out my office, that I'll just plan throughout the days to sit at my desk doing my work, and the public and visitors and alumni and students can just come into my office and enjoy the view. So this is an open invitation to all of you to come by and see my space. So, um, and also, after you've done, you're done looking through the building, please return to the Loop Family Cafe on the Quad, where we have a new signature ice cream called Sunshine and Chocolate, which will be available exclusively in the cafe when it opens on March 19th. So thank you very, very much for coming. I really appreciate your support and enthusiasm for this project and enjoy the building. Thanks. I love these scissors. Look at these things. <laughs> All right. I don't know. So walk. Okay. One, two, three.